Hello, good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to a new season of our C Secret Lecture Series. I'm Rani Abisar, the Dean of the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami. First, let me thank all of you for joining us tonight for this online session. And also, uh, please let me recognize our C Secret sponsors. Without them, uh, this entire series could not exist. Our supporters, we have Bank of America, the Shepard Broad Foundation, Meredith Ann Dasbelt Foundation, William J. Goldway, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Elizabeth Lambertson Foundation, John McCaffan Family Foundation, Taylor and Melissa Whitefan, Myron and Nicole Wine, the Welsh Family Foundation, and Southern Glazers Wine and Spirit. Thank you all for supporting this very important series. Our school is committed to focus its research and education programs on big issues facing humankind as we evolve in the 21st century. While the most urgent issue right now is finding a solution to the corona pandemic and some amazing work and progress is currently being achieved by some of our colleagues at the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine, we are tackling other issues that we faced before Corona started, and we will continue to face long after Corona is mostly resolved. Strategically, we are dividing our attention into four major activities. Feeding the world, saving lives, protecting our natural resources, and unearthing sea secrets. Our sea secret season this year will be devoted to lectures on these four activities, and most of our lecturers have been chosen from our own worldwide experts. Tonight, our speakers will discuss the challenges of feeding the world. As human population continues to explode, and the amount of proteins harvested from the ocean is causing devastating depletion and even extinction of some fish species, it is urgent to find a sustainable alternative to commercial fishing. We believe that aquaculture is that alternative. It is not a new idea, it has been around for a while, but a rapid progress is needed to make it a workable solution. Our school is internationally recognized for its research and education programs in sustainable, cost-efficient, and ecologically friendly aquaculture practices. Over the years, under the leadership of Professor Daniel Benetti, we have built a global network of former graduates of our program who are now scientists, educators, and private sector professionals working together on solving this complex challenge. Tonight, you will hear from Professor Benetti, the director of our Aquaculture Center, and from Professor John Stiglitz, who studied under Dr. Benetti. But before we listen to Dr. Benetti and Stiglitz, I would like to introduce one of our the alumni of our aquaculture program, Dr. Aaron Welch. Dr. Welch received his PhD in 2015. He is the founder and president of Two Docs Shellfish LLC, a vertically integrated shellfish production company with farm sites in Tampa Bay and Cedar Key and a hatchery facility in Fort Pierce, Florida. Dr. Welch also works as a consultant for fin fish productions companies where he focuses largely on environmental monitoring and compliance. Dr. Welch. Uh, Dean, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this great event. Let me share my screen so I can Get some images for everyone. Dean, I'm not sure if I'm a notable graduate of the Rosenstiel School. Um, there's a lot of exceptional, exceptional people coming uh, from this institution, but I'm certainly a grateful graduate. Uh, the university and the Rosenstiel School have been a cornerstone of my professional life since 2006 when I, when I first came to be a student in Dan Benetti's program. Um, I came back then because I was excited specifically about offshore aquaculture. Uh, but I stayed because this program exposed me to a whole new world uh, of opportunity and gave me the freedom to explore all of it. Um, 
since I've been w with and around the Rose and Steel School, I've had the opportunity to work all over uh, the world doing aquaculture, um, working on a variety of issues, especially environmental issues. And of late, um, we've been very focused on shellfish farming. Um, the training I've had, the opportunities, um, the networks, the camaraderie and the friendships, uh, like my friendship with your next two speakers, Dan and John, uh, they've all just meant the world to me professionally and personally. Um, and on top of that, the university has continued to support our business um, simply by turning out exceptional professionals. Um, I started a company called Two Doc Shellfish after I finished at UM. Uh, you're seeing some of the images from our operation now. Uh, we're a vertically integrated shellfish company. We produce clams, oysters, and we produce Sunray Venus clams here in Florida. Uh, and our company has been the beneficiary of truly world-class talent uh, that comes from the Rosen Steel School. We have a pipeline of talent. Uh, it runs from our farms on the Gulf Coast, and it runs from our, our hatchery in Fort Pierce, and it runs right back to the laboratories uh, and the classrooms of the Rosen Steel School. Uh, we're a small company, but we're punching way above our weight because of the talent we have. Um, our hatchery manager and two of our assistant managers are graduates of the MPS program at Rose and Steel, uh, and they're just key members of our team. So I think the future is bright for aquaculture uh, in general. Uh, we're learning how to feed the world, and we're learning how to do it sustainably. Uh, and I think the future is bright for the Rose and Steel School because we're so involved in this, in this progress. Um, I'm excited to be a part of it all in the coming years, and I look forward to hearing the next couple of talks. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, uh, John. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, the main speaker for this evening. Dr. Benetti is a professor of our Department of Marine Ecosystem and Society, and is the Director of Aquaculture. With over 30 years of experience in aquaculture worldwide, he specializes in hatchery and open ocean grow-up technologies of marine species, such as cobia, snapper, tuna, mai mai, and flounder. Dr. Benetti is a consultant to private and government sectors in the Americas, US, Europe, Asia, Caribbean, and Australia, primarily to advance technology for hatchery and sustainable offshore aquaculture development. Dr. John Stiglitz is also a professor in our Department of Marine Ecosystem and Society. Utilizing approaches centered on applied ecophysiology and bioenergetics of marine fish, his research aims to address marine aquaculture production challenges while also developing a greater understanding of the impact of both natural and anthropogenic induced environmental stressors on marine fish species throughout the world. His research also includes sustainability within the seafood business sector, and he serves as a consultant to commercial marine aquaculture companies in the Caribbean and the America. Daniel and John, all yours. Well, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, and good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for being in attendance. I'm honored to be here, reaching out to so many of you. We have several hundred people in attendance, it's incredible. But uh, we'll introduce you to the world of aquaculture for those of you who are not familiar with it. And what we and our colleagues are doing in, in this exciting field with enormous challenges and opportunities. We want to make this very informal, so just welcome aboard and bear with us. Uh, I'm not going to bother you with lots of data or tables or, or graphs you know, about the global trends in human population, wild fisheries, and aquaculture. Uh, there's not enough time for that, so let's just cut through the chase and hit the ground running. <laughs> okay, I'll start by saying that the challenge of feeding the world, an estimated global population of nine billion dollars, nine billion people in 2050 is daunting. It's a gargantuan undertaking and one that we have already taken and made a priority at Rosen School School. I'm not sure if we have undertaken this challenge or it took us but we are together on it and there is no way back. Well, the reality is that people just seem to love fish. Approximately, approximately 3 billion people around the globe are dependent on fish as the principal source of animal protein. And that's by choice or, or necessity, but that's a reality. 
Uh, fish consumption, some of the things that you might know, that fish consumption is higher than any other animal protein. And another fact is that aquaculture production surpassed beef production since 2013. Uh, the per capita fish consumption grew from 9 kilos in, in 61 to 20 kilos in 2018. And those are all facts. Those are backed by evidence. Um, you know, it, let's not uh, look into the, the, the numbers here. It doesn't really matter. What matters are the trends. And you can tell by the trends that, uh, you know, we show clearly. These are the latest figures from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. And... Um, they clearly show that wild fishes have flattened over the last decades, and aquaculture continues to rise steadily. This is what uh, you have to keep in mind. And indeed, many important fisheries resources are either on the verge of collapsing or being exploited at their maximum sustainable yield. We can no longer, we, we cannot take any more from the ocean. Some stocks were fished out to oblivion. But meanwhile, human population continues to rise. And we are almost 8 billion. I believe we are 7.5, 7.8 billion people now. And we're expected to be 9 billion people by the year 2050. And nonetheless, there is still, there's still quite a bit. Uh, uh, aquaculture already contributes with over 50% of all seafood for human consumption. But there is still quite a bit of misleading messages about aquaculture out there. And we're going to be addressing some of these misconceptions to see if we can get to all on board. Um, we, uh, again, the global, I said no data, it doesn't really matter, but it's a lot of, a lot of seafood out there, 180 million metric tons. Of each aquaculture is producing 115 million metric tons, of which 85 million metric tons are animal protein, and the, the rest is algae, macroalgae, et cetera. Now, having said that, this is the global picture. The U.S. is lagging behind. Uh, over 90% of all seafood consumed in the United States is imported. And 80, more than 80% of that are farmed. So our, trade, our seafood trade deficit has grown to over 16 billion, almost 17 billion dollars a year. And it's increasing at around 8%. This is 25% of the United States uh, trade deficit. It's huge. Now, any way you look at it, and this is Bloomberg, this is not uh, FAO, this is Bloomberg, because obviously there are huge uh, opportunities here. I mean, there will be shortages. Any way you look at it, there is not going to be, the, 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 the supply is not going to be enough to, to take care of the demand. So again, without going to the figures, you can see clearly that there are challenges and opportunities here. We're not talking about the far-fetched future. We're talking about the next five to 10 years. Already, we're going to need 20 million additional tons of fish to feed the world. And within the next two to three decades, it's going to be 30 to 40 billion. It's just uh, mind-boggling. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Well, hey, projections, you know, big deal. They almost never work. Well, not in this case. We, we saw it coming, and look at it. This is the Miami Herald. If you look at the date of this publication, it made actually the front page. It was October 2005, right? Or, yeah, this has been 15 years ago. The, we predicted, looking at the figures, that within the next 10 years, aquaculture would be producing more than 50% of the world. Well, guess what? By the year 2013, we reached that target. So. That was an easy one because, you know, it was clear. The trends were clear and they continue to be. Um, it's, uh, you know, the trend has materialized and I believe that our projections, the one that we're showing to you right now will materialize. Um, well, so where are we going to get our fish from and how? As some people are still questioning whether or when should we do aquaculture. Well, let's get on board because it's already a reality. This is the aquatic counterpart of agriculture and land farming. It's here to stay, it's not going anywhere. It's, uh, it's not whether, if or when, it's how and where it will expand. And I'll ask you a few basic questions I'm, I'm going to be answering briefly as we go. Is it going to be traditional new technology? 
it cannot be traditional technology. It's just not efficient enough. Uh, we cannot do that. It has got to be new technology that we are together into. Now, it's going to be inland. It's going to be coastal, land-based. We don't think so. Well, obviously, there is a space for that. It will continue to be. RAS stands for Recirculating Aquaculture Systems. They are great. They are phenomenal uh, pieces of engineering and very efficient. And land-based and RAS, England and coastal, will continue to play a major role. But when you look at, at 30 to 40 or to 30 million metric tons, there is no other solution. There is no other way but the open ocean. We have got to go offshore. Our, our exclusive economic zone here in the United States is the largest in the world and is not being used for that. Uh, how are we going to do this? Well, again, it is with good, solid science, technology, education, and training. This is what's needed to improve the ecological and economical efficiency so that we can develop this environmentally sustainable and profitable way. The natural resources that are available to us will not allow us to, to produce all that. We need to get much better at what we do. I like to show this little, uh, you know, the, this conception here, this presentation, because it's, it shows some of the moving parts of the aquaculture cycle. There are so many of them, and here just a few are represented. Uh, the mechanism is going faster than I thought. But if you look at it, each one of these gears represent a phase, a state of aquaculture. And each one of these phases has so many teeth. And each one of these teeth or two has, uh, it's, a, it's a variable, it's a parameter. And at any given time, any one of those two or teeth could break, which we all know it could happen. And then when it happens, the whole system goes into disarray and we, you know, the whole thing collapsed. Well, that's where we, that's what we do. We focus on those teeth. Those teeth represent the parameters that are important for us to, to resolve. Sometimes we identify them ourselves, but most often than not, than, than not, it is the industry that shows the need and we address them. But we finally then got to where we are at. What do we do? This is our experimental hatch in the University of Miami. Many of you you don't even know it exists, but it is there. It's a bird's view. It's quite nice. Beyond an academic and research institution, we are much more than that. We have a very successful R&D. We develop technology, we transfer technology, and occasionally we produce to assist the industry as needed. We have very strong academic and research components based on innovation, cutting edge technologies, and we have a proven track record of delivery. With the, within our peers, with academics, with the, with the industry, with the agencies that fund us. We are certified by some of the most coveted uh, certification, uh, certification process that there is, the global gap. And also, this is our greatest pride. We graduated and trained over 150 professionals at all levels. And that his, that it has been brought up by the Dean and Arrow. This is probably our greatest accomplished accomplishment and the one that we should be the proudest of. Our network is the world over. We are operating at all aspects of aquaculture. This is our facility. We think they are modest, but uh, we do a lot of cool stuff here. Uh, interesting research. And our facilities are, again, they are small, but large enough to occasionally engage in production. But they are small enough for, for us to run experimental trials, design experiments, and publish, which is part of our, our job. Now, without going into any details, most of our research focuses on animal welfare, which includes nutrition, health, and any other aspect that Dr. Stiglitz is going to cover afterwards. Uh, when the Dean and when myself, when we talk about international collaborations the world over, we're not speaking figuratively. These are some, well, that I remember, those are the countries we are at. We are all over. We are in Southeast Asia, in Asia, in Australia, in South Europe, everywhere, the Middle East. Of course, we have a very strong presence in the Americas, in the Caribbean, Hawaii. We actually added Canada yesterday because we began developing a new relationship with CAT, is the Center of Aquaculture Technologies from Canada. So we are everywhere. 
Now, this is nice. Everybody loves fish, and most of you would recognize most of them. Uh, so we don't have time to go over the detail. But those are some of the species that we work with at different feasibility levels. For that, for many, we have, uh, we know the whole cycle. We have developed the technologies available. Others we're still experimenting with. Most of them are in our own hatchery here. We keep them in the hatchery. Others are through international collaboration. But you're looking here at groupers, flounders, snappers, yellowtail snapper, uh, the jacks, uh, mahi, and cobia, and tuna, pumpkin, hogfish. And the tuna, we have collaboration with the international uh, the IATTC, the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission. And with the, the um, Goliath group over here, we have collaboration with Cartagena, Colombia, St. Mary, and St. Michael. These are two species we focus on. Cobia, while you read, there are, the list is long. We're not going to go over all of them, but you see Cobia and Red Snapper. Cobia is being exclusively grown by Open Blue. We're going to get to it in more details later. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing of Cobia is that it grows five to ten times faster than most other you know, normal fish species. It grows to five kilos in one year. It's astonishing. The snapper would grow to half a kilo, maybe 0.82 pounds in one year. It's a great species, but those are our focus. Kobe is being basically taken over exclusively by Open Blue, but the red snapper is one of the species that whose technology we have. Now, we, we are ahead of the industry. I say that with pride because we have turned key technologies available to produce from egg to market a number of species. And uh, I was told not to say that, but you know, you know where we're at, come and get it. Because <laughs> what else can I say? We have red snapper technology, we produce juveniles and there are no takers, nowhere to go. It's time for us to do it, to take this to the next level. Now, as I said, sometimes occasionally we supplement our partners uh, with some production. So they already open blue sea farms in Panama. They already have the full cycle. They have their hatchery and all that. But once in a while, they need additional fish to stock their cages. And we produce this last month, we shipped the fish to them. Now again, back to the talent pipeline. I mean, it's, it's all about the people. It's the one that we are the proudest of. I like this slide because it shows some of the all hands in, of course. These are more or less the, the, the current um, students. We have a total of 20 right now. But this picture on the right, I really love it because you are seeing there Dr. Aaron Wells, who just spoke with you. You see Dr. Stevens, who will speak with you. You see Ron Honig, our manager, or hatchery manager. You see Bruno Sardenberg, the director of aquaculture at Open Blue, at uh, uh, Atlantic Sapphire in Homestead. We, which is the largest uh, recirculating aquaculture salmon farm in the world, right here. Uh, we have uh, Jorge Larcon, who is the, one of the key players, one of the, the technical directors of Open Blue. And so far, I can go one by one, but they are all players. They are all movers and shakers. And again, uh, some of the highlights of our uh, research program. We are very pragmatic and focused on R&D and applied technology of commercial important species. We look at them at all life stages aimed at closing their life cycle from egg to market and developing feeds that are ecologically and economically efficient. efficient. We work for optimizing production technologies and lowering the cost because in the end of the day, it's not just the sustainability and feeding the world. It has to be an operation that it's profitable. We have the ability to provide unique genetical material to the industry. We we are result driven and propelled by the industry. There is nothing that we do in our hatchery that doesn't have a, an objective to be useful. And more importantly, there is solid good science behind everything we do. We cannot get away otherwise. This is just one of the examples. We don't have time to go over the details, but Open Blue obviously is focusing on COVID, is funding this project. We have a selective breeding in which we Without going to the details, we are looking at improving the growth, survival, disease resistance, feed conversion, and the filet yield of this species, which is unique. And we are very grateful to Open Blue because they are the one, they, they are the most important uh, industry commercial partner that we have. Feeds and feeding, probably not known to, more, to most of you, 
but 60, sometimes 70% of all production costs in an aquaculture uh, firm, it's fee. It's extremely expensive. And it basically is based on fish wool, fish oil, which is not ecologically efficient. So again, without going into the details, we have a very strong uh, nutrition program led by Dr. Jorge Suarez, who you've seen here, and, and several graduate students. Uh, we focus ultimately on improving ecological and economic efficiency of things, making things better. Now, this was Aaron Welch, one of his papers. This was a great paper. I'll, I'll tell you uh, some of the details later. But uh, it, again, the environmental impact, there is any human production activity has got some level of environmental fish print. We call fish print in aquaculture. We don't call footprint. Well, we have done, we have worked and collected data for the last 20 years from the early stage to the demonstration project, all the way to commercial farms now in, 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 Costa, in uh, Panama. And uh, this was funded by NOAA, by the way. It's not funded by Open Blue, but it was, com it was conducted at Open Blue Farm. We have proven for once and for all that well sited, well managed offshore aquaculture, the open ocean where depths are greater, currents are stronger, the impacts are minimal, the, the footprint. It's, uh, there is no discerning or, or significant or cumulative impact. Now, this was awesome, kudos to Aaron, because this was the most downloaded, most read paper in the journal of the World Aquaculture Society in the last two years. A little bit of kudos for me too, because I was the principal investigator on this, uh, <laughs> on this project. But uh, what you're looking at now, it's Open Blue Sea Farms Farm off the coast of Panama. This is the most advanced technology anywhere in the world. You will not see another one. They're the largest uh, offshore submerged farm anywhere in the world. You are looking at 22 submerged cages here, stocked with coders that are producing to feed our market. It's extraordinary. This is what you see inside the cages. The environment that these fish live in is truly amazing. And uh, I keep bringing Open Blue because without a doubt, they have been with us from the get-go. They have been one of the greatest supporters. And what they do is truly extraordinary. This is, this is what you see when you raise the cages. And that's the final project, uh, the product in the market. Now, I will bring it up, Atlantic Sapphire Homestead. We do not have a formal agreement with them, not yet, at least. But it is truly amazing what they have done. They're in Homestead, land-based, and they are the largest salmon land-based farm in the world. And although we don't have, look at what has happened in the last two years. They have built, they have stocked, and then they are harvesting. We see we are feeding, we are eating the fish that they are producing. They hired six of our people already in key positions. So obviously we are involved with them, and this is highly relevant because of what's happening. Now we do have, I'm almost finishing, we do have a top candidate for land-based aquaculture in the United States or anywhere in the world. It's done in South Korea, it's done in Japan, and we have done it in Miami. We'll continue to expand doing it in Miami. But again, there is no commercial activity going on and it's hard to understand why not, because we are ready. We work with Innova C, that's another company of the Cuna del Mar uh, uh, branch of companies. It's um, and they have already ready to a model, segmented, replicable uh, model for grass culture. Uh, we can do this. We have the technology for doing for, for American market. Uh, before leaving, I cannot not mention artificial intelligence. As we move on into the future, we are already doing artificial intelligence. One of my PhD students, uh, Jagen, is already using artificial intelligence. That is his uh, dissertation. We're using tools to optimize, you know, the machine learning to optimize production from egg to market. It's, he's assisting Nova C in developing the bio, uh, biomass estimation project because it's gonna be, it is the way to go and we are going to be ready when we come, come to it. Finally, cellular aquaculture, we are not doing ourselves in our lab, but we are participating under contract with this uh, biotech company from California, uh, Blue Nailu. We ship live mahi and red snapper for them so that they can take the stem cells and do the mass proliferation of them and provide the 
lab-grown teeth. We're all going that direction. We'll be ready when it comes to it. So in conclusion, uh, we, we can, we will do it. And I think I was able to show how we can achieve, achieve that. But it's not just sustainable aquaculture. We believe that well-managed fishing will be always important. So we have to combine that with restocking program, which I personally am very keen on. So if we combine fisheries, aquaculture, restocking, we will be able to meet the demand for wholesome seafood production to feed the world in the next decades. So, and then with that, I, you know, there have been so many organizations and agencies and private companies helping assist. It would be too many to, to put in one slide. But that would take away a, a little of the two main ones that have been with us from the get-go for the last 20 years. NOAA and Open Blue CIFAR. Nothing of what you saw here, or very little of what you saw and what I presented would have happened if they weren't behind us. They have been incredible. Even all these people that graduated and were formed here were indirectly or directly formed, uh, uh, funded by them. Because even if they did not take the tuition money, for example, they were trained in projects that uh, were conducted under their sponsorship. So with that, part one is concluded. Dr. John Stiglitz will pick it up from here and, and run away with it. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Thanks, Dan. John, all yours. Thanks, Dr. Benetti. That was, that was fantastic. So, uh, building upon this, in terms of talking about feeding the world, uh, sustainable marine aquaculture, <clears throat> we're at the forefront of these technologies. And so I'm gonna get into a little bit more about sort of why aquaculture. I've been seeing in the, the questions already, you know, concerns over offshore aquaculture, uh, why somebody mentioned, you know, why not eat more plants, this sort of thing. Well, we have one planet, right? We have limited natural resources. So it come to, comes down to how are we gonna utilize these natural resources in the most efficient and sustainable manner to feed a growing human population. Human population is expected to hit 9.8 billion by the year 2050. Okay, it's astounding. And so we talk about food production for a growing population. We see this, this was a UNFAO report came out a couple of years ago, you know, more people, more food, worse water, right? So how does the world feed an additional 2.2 billion mouths between now and 2050? We're already seeing the impacts of food production on earth. A huge amount of earth is dedicated to producing food for mankind, what are we gonna do with 2.2 billion more mouths between <clears throat> now and 2050? And so impacts of food production, whether it's you know, meat eating or eating plants, as you see in the monoculture of soybeans and the, the image on the bottom there, uh, you know, clear cut rainforest to make room for uh, vegetable production there. We see that over 26% of Earth's land is used for livestock production, okay? And terrestrial agriculture has a huge impact on earth. And so how can we improve the sustainability of food production? And that's really what we're tackling here at the university. And it comes down to a matter of supply and demand, especially when we talk about seafood. Okay, so we're facing a global protein crisis. This was an image put out by Aquaspark, a global investment fund, makes investments in sustainable aquaculture businesses. Uh, but this is looking at how seafood production is in fact the most efficient solution. And so the demand for seafood is expected to grow to 230 million tons by 2050. Okay, so that means the aquaculture industry is gonna to have to grow massively to meet that demand. As you saw in some of Dr. Benetti's slides earlier, in terms of the amount of protein, animal protein that we pull out of the oceans is really plateaued. We're not gonna really exceed that 90, 95 million metric tons that we're pulling out of the oceans right now. If anything, it's going to decline in coming years as we see the impacts of climate change, and treating our oceans uh, <clears throat> like a trash can for the past decades, they're taking an impact in terms of the overall fisheries. Okay, so animal protein also isn't an ideal protein. It's an ideal protein source for humans. Okay, evidence suggests that increased seafood consumption, particularly consumption of marine animals rich in omega-3 fatty acids such as DHA, may have contributed significantly to the evolutionary growth in the hominid brain cells. Okay, so 
there's a reason why we are basically adapted for thriving on increased seafood intake. Okay? And history has shown that time and again. So it comes down to aquaculture being the most efficient way to produce animal protein. So if we're looking for solutions, how are we gonna feed all these mouths? Aquaculture is gonna play a major role in that. And one of the most common metrics that you may see in terms of grading the efficiency of different types of animal production systems is the feed conversion ratio. So you can see a very simplistic diagram here looking at that in terms of the estimated feed required to gain one pound of biomass, right? So you see with cows, it takes about 6.8 pounds of feed to produce one pound of edible biomass. Now you see on the far left there, farm-raised fish, and that's actually for a carnivorous farm-raised fish, that's for a salmon, 1.1 pounds of feed. And currently, they're even seeing uh, results less than one with some of these species, okay? And for some other species, such as tilapia, it's far below that. And so genetics plays a huge role in this, breeding of fish. For every five generations of breeding in salmon, for instance, FCR has improved 20%. Okay, so we have the tools to improve this. We have the tools to make food production more efficient. Why are we not doing more of this? Well, here at the university, we're developing research-based solutions to improve aquaculture, the, environmentally, the environmental sustainability of it, the economic viability of it, as well as looking at the human health benefits of seafood consumption, right? Because all seafood is not created equal, okay? So some is more nutritious, some is, is not as nutritious. Okay, so we're working to help the industry move in a sustainable direction. We're conducting research into land-based and ocean-based solutions to meet the increasing seafood demand. You see an image here of open blue sea farms that Dr. Benet mentioned earlier, producing cobia offshore of Panama. And then you see land-based marine fish production occurring here. This is a farm actually up in Connecticut, Ideal Fish Producing the Bronzino. Again, uh, owned and run by a uh, <clears throat> UM graduate from this program. So that's the bronzino that you might see in the, the local markets being produced here in the US. And it's important to remember that marine aquaculture comes in many forms, right? You might hear about the fed aquaculture. So about 70% of aquatic animal production requires feed. Okay, so these are the carnivorous species such as the Florida pompano that you see here, the cobia, the snapper that you've heard talked about as well. And then there's extractive aquaculture. So these are the unfed species, the bivalves, the macroalgae, Right? And so seaweeds, seaweeds have actually represented the largest group of marine aquaculture organisms since 2004. They account for nearly half of reported marine aquaculture production globally. So massive potential there. But then again, here in the U.S., you don't really hear a lot about seaweed farming. And so there's huge potential for all types of aquaculture production, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. And so there was a study that came out a couple of years ago looking at the potential for marine aquaculture. And uh, it was quite alarming. It found that in just a fraction of a percent of the ocean, you could produce as much seafood as is currently harvested by wild fishermen. This is astounding. So this is an area similar in size to Lake Michigan. Okay, so on the panel on the left, you see an image of sort of where, what that fraction of a percent of the ocean would look like. And those areas highlighted, uh, you know, have different attributes that are favorable to aquaculture production of certain types of species. Then on the right, you see the amount of ocean area utilized for industrial wild catch fisheries, right? So we have the tools to do this more efficiently. How can it be so efficient? It really comes down to the efficiency of aquaculture production, which I mentioned earlier. And again, that's a topic for another debate or maybe in the question session in terms of, you know, the biological and physiological attributes of fish and other marine species that make them so efficient in terms of producing food for mankind. Also, there's the efficiency that's obtained by farming in three dimensions in the sea. Again, you're able to utilize the depth of the ocean, as we saw with some of these uh, net pen operations, whereas in a land-based setting, you don't have that luxury. It's more of a two-dimensional activity. So here at the university, we're putting the science behind food choices. That's something to keep in mind in terms of uh, making choices in a seafood market. What are you gonna be putting in your body? This was a great, uh, what we call splash course came out from a uh, company called Love the Wild. Um, looking at all the different attributes of aquaculture production and all the, the fun facts that we, you know, we love to talk about. And these are ones that are good to keep in mind when they're choosing items they're in the grocery store or out at restaurants, wherever you may be. And so here at the university, we're developing research-based solutions for feeding mankind 
through sustainable use of natural resources. And we're actually optimizing production technologies through physiological and bioenergetics research to achieve improved economic and ecological efficiencies, which at the end of the day, that's really the key to sustainability. Okay, so there's been a lot of misinformation in the past about, uh, and currently still, uh, regarding aquaculture production. And a lot of that is based on outdated science, inaccurate science. Uh, the industry has made tremendous gains over the years, and it comes through scientific achievements, scientific advances, such as those we're achieving here at the university in terms of making it a more sustainable activity, more efficient activity. There's also a U-Link initiative occurring here at the university focused on sustainable aquaculture. So the U-Link is a uh, interdisciplinary research program. So it's taking that interdisciplinary approach to resolving many of the challenges associated with marine aquaculture. This is a, a team of collaborators, number of faculty members here at the university, experts in each of their own fields, trying to address some of the major challenges associated with food production for mankind and addressing those challenges that are associated traditionally with aquaculture. So we're trying to develop integrated solutions for sustainably feeding the world, improving coastal water quality and building resiliency in coastal communities and doing so in a way that may incorporate some of these um, engineering solutions that you see here in the panel on the right. This is from a study that came out a couple of years ago and uh, looking at how you might be able to utilize these integrated multi-trophic aquaculture type uh, arrangements for sustainably producing seafood, IMTA production. We'll get into that here in the next slide. So there's huge potential for aquaculture to help out coastal communities. So nearly half of the world's human population relies on the oceans for their primary source of food. And experts agree that wild food production capacity of the oceans has plateaued and will likely decline in the coming decades. Coastal communities in particular are feeling the pain of such fishery declines, and climate change is expected to exacerbate this trend. Yet coastal regions remain some of the most densely populated areas of the world. So we're conducting research to determine how sustainable aquaculture can help address these challenges. And IMTA, or Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, is one such way whereby we may be able to sort of harness all of that energy contained in that feed input and that is that may be lost in more traditional systems and capture that through additional crops of, for instance, shellfish or seaweeds or deposit feeders on the bottom and really have sort of a closed cycle in these open environments to maximize the benefit of the inputs for such a type of aquaculture operation. Uh, research has shown that when conducted properly, IMTA techniques can actually recycle up to 35 to 100% of nutrients from fed aquaculture operations. And also there's the potential for restorative aquaculture opportunities in many of these areas. And these restorative aquaculture opportunities are those which help restore ecosystem services that may have been lost through other, you know, through coastal development, through agricultural development, through eutrophication impacts, perhaps by implementing these sustainable aquaculture techniques that may or may not be focused necessarily on food production, you can restore some of these ecosystem services and help generate more robust wild fisheries in the future. And also aquaculture plays a key role in enhancing coastal resilience. Okay, it can add to coastal resilience both economically and environmentally to coastal communities while improving water quality and supplying sustainably produced food products from markets around the world. So restorative aquaculture again can play a key role here in helping restore these ecosystems back to a state where wild species can thrive. And we see here that some of these techniques have been utilized in temperate regions around the world. But when we look to examples of this in the tropical zone, you really don't see many successful examples of this. So we're trying to address that and look at why, why not, and develop successful techniques for this that could be deployed in the Caribbean and in the Americas to really help <clears throat> revitalize many of these coastal communities that have historically been dependent on seafood for their livelihoods and for feeding their communities and perhaps sustainable aquaculture can play a key role there. Not perhaps, we know it can. The time is right for aquaculture, all right? It's a great time to be in this field, in this industry. Uh, there have been recent legislative efforts. Uh, the executive order came through trying to uh, expand domestic offshore aquaculture production, trying to improve, sort of uh, <coughs> resolve many of the uh, regulatory challenges that have existed in terms of not having a lead agency uh, in charge of sort of issuing permits for this 
and so that folks can actually engage in this sustainable activity. The Aqua Act or versions of it have been introduced both in the uh, House and the Senate, so we'll have to see how that plays out. And also with COVID-19, we're seeing COVID-19 impacts in terms of highlighting issues within the complex seafood supply chain. Okay, folks may not have realized how truly complex the seafood supply chain is until COVID hit. And now we see that, oh wow, all the seafood, Dr. Bonet mentioned that we're importing over 91% of our seafood here in the US. Wow, well, if countries start shutting their borders, that's gonna cause an impact in terms of seafood production, or seafood availability here in the States. And then also the importance, we're seeing a heightened importance of healthy seafood in communities. Everybody, one of the things with COVID-19 has shown is say, okay, you wanna be as healthy as possible to be able to ward off any uh, diseases that may be around you, right? And so there's a growing trend amongst humans around the world trying to improve their overall health and well-being, and seafood plays a key role in that. And so the time is right for aquaculture to help improve that because in many cases, what we find is that farm-raised products, the nutritional quality of them can either meet or exceed in many cases that that we see from wild uh, products. And we're conducting research activities on developing a more sustainable seafood supply chain. I mentioned how truly complex these seafood supply chains are throughout the world for the various seafood products. You see here a simplistic diagram looking at whether it's fisheries or aquaculture, how many levels there are from where that fish is actually caught or farm raised to the point where it ends up on your plate. Okay, and a disruption anywhere along the way here could have disastrous effects either for the end consumer or for the producer, right? And we see this happening with COVID-19 in terms of disrupting that seafood supply chain. And we actually have some uh, uh, funded research projects right now funded by NOAA and another one through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission looking at this for uh, Yelltail Snapper with the NOAA project and the uh, Olive Flounder for the Atlantic States project. So at the end of the day, many folks, they say, well, what, what's it gonna be? Is it gonna be farmed or wild, right? What should we buy? What should, should we ask for at a restaurant? Well, you gotta take certain things into account here. Wild seafood production, at the end of the day, it's an extractive activity. There's no getting around that, okay? This is the last remaining type of animal protein production that is conducted this way. You do not see us going out and saying, well, I need to bring home some uh, steak for dinner, so I'm gonna go round up some wild animals and, and bring them home to put on the dinner table. You just don't see that happening. But with seafood, apparently that's okay to still do. So <clears throat> you have to keep that in mind. How do you choose the best seafood? Should we buy farmed or wild? We need both, okay? So I encourage you to buy both, okay? We do need our wild fisheries, but let's target those wild fisheries that are managed in a sustainable way and that have shown that they can endure a certain level of fishing pressure over time, okay? So we need both, but make an educated decision and help combat seafood fraud. This was a study that came out recently from Oceana looking at the level of seafood fraud in the industry. This was mislabeling by retail outlets. You see, I'm sorry for those of you who like to go to the sushi venues, about three quarters of uh, those samples that they looked at were mislabeled. So uh, combat seafood fraud, right? Be an educated consumer, know what you're putting into your body. Where did it come from? Is this a farm raised product or a wild one? There are good choices from both sectors, okay? So you shouldn't, you know, be one of these people that just says, oh yeah, I don't eat farm-raised fish, or oh, I only eat wild fish, or you're, you know, that, that could be a problem. So we need both to feed these 2.2 billion mouths that we're gonna have by 2050. And there's also the potential for whole fish, okay? Plate-sized fish, you see a whole yelltail snapper on a plate here, delicious, very popular here in South Florida, throughout the Caribbean region and the Americas. Not necessarily so popular in other parts of the country, uh, but this is actually a much more sustainable way to eat and it helps combat seafood fraud because if you're an educated consumer and you know what a yelltail snapper or other type of whole fish that you're having on your plate, for instance, a bronzino that I mentioned earlier, that's very popular for a whole fish production uh, <clears throat> methodology, you can help combat seafood fraud. And it's more sustainable because we're leaving the big fish out there in the ocean to produce more fish for us in the future. Okay. So we hear a lot about the blue economy these days. Aquaculture plays a key role in a growing blue economy. There are many blue economy opportunities. Aquaculture, I'm biased, but I think it's one of the most promising uh, blue economy opportunities. The UM aquaculture program is at the forefront of development of these technologies, these sustainable aquaculture technologies. 
And in the past, the government has supported many of our past efforts, uh, government and private funding. And uh, that's really helped brought us to, to where we are today. So you may be wondering, how can you help? Be an educated consumer, tell your friends. You know, it's great to see all the participation here on the Sea Secrets Lecture Series. Uh, go out and tell your friends, right? Let's put the science out there as opposed to the misinformation campaigns that are so prevalent in the media today, okay? So there's good science out there showing truly uh, the potential for sustainable food production from our oceans. And so support sustainable seafood farming and the science behind it, right? And so I mentioned that, you know, public and private funds have helped brought us to this point. But at the end of the day, more investment is needed to take it to the next level. So with that, I say thank you. Thanks for attending this evening, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks uh, for the speakers. I really appreciate, we really appreciate, and thanks everybody for joining. Before we uh, take the questions, that will be organized by your uh, uh, communication people. I would like to remind everybody that our next uh, lecture is going to be on November 10th at 6 p.m. and will be given by uh, Robin Bell. Uh, you will receive a notice on uh, how to join that presentation as well. And uh, for question, um, uh, Diana, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, select the questions that have been asked, I believe, from the, uh, from the audience. All right, thank you all very much. I'm the Director of Communications and my partner Josh Coco and I are gonna share this. Um, there's been several uh, questions asked. Uh, maybe this one we should direct to Aaron uh, from uh, regarding harmful algal blooms, um, talking about thousands of tons of fecal waste, um, issues about Gulf Coast. But first, Dr. Benetti, why don't you talk a little bit about the the new Gulf Coast permits that have been issued and what that means in terms for the industry and how those concerns could be addressed as if that will um, create helpful, harmful algal blooms. Well, it's, a, it's a good point and a good question. This is very new. It was approved, the EPA, the NEPA permit has been granted. This was last week. This is the Valela project. We are collaborating with them. It's in the Gulf of Mexico. It's about 40 miles offshore. The Gulf is just for one cage, one demonstration cage, but it has been approved. It's the first step towards, you know, beginning to develop this process in the Gulf. Uh, there is another uh, petition for, for, um, for uh, permits in the West Coast of the San Diego, uh, but um, in terms of obviously the, the, the impact Aaron would be able to corroborate that because he was the main author on that uh, paper. I mean, it's going to take a lot to make an impact in terms of uh, with the nutrients that are being produced in those cages because, again, with the right depth, with the right oceanic circulation, with the right currents, you know, the, the, the impact of nitrogen and the, uh, will be minimal, should be minimal. It should not affect uh, the environment. Aaron can elaborate on that. Yeah, the the issue of nutrients and offshore aquaculture um, is an issue that has to be discussed in context. In context, um, for sure, uh, aquaculture operations located in in restricted coastal water bodies that don't have a lot of flow um, that can be a problem. Um, you can overnutrify a water body, and all sorts of pro harmful algae blooms, eutrophication, all sorts of problems can happen, and they can happen pretty fast. Um, but open ocean aquaculture, like Dan is discussing, is a qualitatively different thing. We're talking about um, culture systems that are miles offshore in very high energy environments. Um, and most importantly, they're in oligotrophic environments, which means an environment that's nutrient uh, starved, basically. Um, the waste coming out of these cages in this context, um, it's taken almost immediately up by plankton communities. Um, my research showed um, over about a seven year period, essentially nothing. Um, this was a farm that was producing about 1,500 tons a year. Um, for seven years, we essentially couldn't find any measurable impact on the environment from ammonia, nitrates, nitrites, uh, chlorophyll, chlorophyll levels downstream and around the cages. Um, in the open ocean context, those nutrients are taken up by the bios uh, and they're shuttled up the food chain and they become a part of the environment in a really natural and elegant way. Um, you know, ecologists have done a lot of studies and they've 
they've concluded that probably somewhere in the order of 90% of the ocean's historical biomass has been removed by industrial fishing. With offshore aquaculture, we're just putting those fish back in the ocean. Um, I give this lecture sometimes to undergrads uh, when Dan invites me back for lectures and I, I, I tease him a little bit. I ask him, you know, what is the difference between farm fish poop and wild fish poop? And the answer is there's no difference. Um, it's all just fish poop. Uh, in a properly sited system uh, with the right sort of professionals operating the farm, offshore aquaculture is an extremely clean and elegant way to produce protein. Uh, I mentioned during my talk, um, I'm involved in the shellfish business now. Um, we produce clams and oysters. I've personally been beat up really badly by red tide. Um, I understand better than most how horrible red tides can be. We used to farm a lot in Pine Island Sound and down around Gasparilla clams. Um, red tide ran us out. Uh, we just can't farm down there anymore. So I get red tide and I get why people are worried about it. And I would never advocate for a technology in the Gulf that I thought would make that problem worse. Uh, it won't if it's managed properly. The scale of the projects that are being talked about are nowhere near the scale that's going to generate the sort of impacts uh, that people worry about. And if I didn't believe that, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make the case. And if I may, Aaron, just to complement, we are the ones who are going to be doing the environmental monitoring of this farm. That's part of our, our research agreement. You are on it. Right. You're going to be one of our consultants in this project. Great. Well, that's my two cents. Josh. Dan or John, how are we going to be able to achieve higher production with so many global challenges such as ocean warming, coastal, and ocean pollution? You want to take that one, uh, John? Sure. So we need to do it in a smart way, right? So you heard uh, in all of the talks touching upon the aspects of having aquaculture be done in a sustainable way, you know, the siting of the locations, the management of these operations, that's what it comes down to. So we know it's possible. It's just a matter of making it happen, okay? And so there have been a number of efforts I mentioned in my talk uh, to stimulate growth of this industry here in the US in terms of offshore aquaculture development, uh, but it's happening throughout the world, right? So there's a reason why that seafood's coming from somewhere and we import over 90% of our seafood here in the US. So other countries are not so reluctant to uh, producing these products. And the key is to get the methods out there that are doing it in a sustainable way, right? So let's utilize the science to show that indeed we can do this effectively, efficiently, and sustainably. Yeah, if I may, again, just to complement, all the questions we've been going through, I've been reading all the questions, they are really smart, very good questions. But the answer, it all boils down to science. We need to conduct science so that we can address and resolve all those questions, all those issues that most of you are raising. Here's another question uh, for Dan or for John. Uh, what is the further research that's needed to be done to help sustainable aquaculture industry grow? What, what, what's the next frontier? Well, I think again, the, we, I raised a lot of issues, a lot of questions, and then John were able to address some of them with some of the answers. Uh, but again, in the end of the day, it is the issue, well, feeds, feeds and feeding. Nutrition, it's crucial. We have to get better and better at using the natural resources to be able to decrease the amount of natural resources uh, that we need to produce fish uh, by using more and more you know, renewable sources of protein. Uh, we look at soybean products, we look at even a, a, a insect meal. We're looking at all of that. And also, again, in a way to reduce the environmental impact out there you know, decreasing the nutrient output of those cages with uh, proper management and proper site selection. I think those are the most important issues. John has been focusing on physiology that is related to it. Uh, how does that um, couple with all that, uh, John? I mean, the data yeah, I that- think, you know, uh, I can add to that. So I think in terms of research directions, I think a key component is an area that we're, uh, involved with now with, with the NOAA and the Atlantic United States project I mentioned in terms of looking at the economics of production. Because at the end of the day, these operations, they have to make money to be economically viable, right? To survive. And so with these projects, we're essentially developing a business incubator here at the University of Miami for 
aquacultural technologies of, for producing these species, right? So figuring out ways, we know that they can be produced. We know how to do it. How do you do it in a way that actually makes money? Okay, that's what's gonna be the next step. And so the reason a lot of the seafood is produced overseas is because it's much cheaper in many cases to do it overseas. And we could have a whole talk about why that is. But at the end of the day, if you're an investor and you say, okay, I wanna get into aquaculture, are you gonna do it in the US and spend years and years and years and lots of money trying to just get a permit to do it? Or are you gonna to go to another country and set up your operation and then sell the product back into the US at a premium price? Right? So it comes down to the economics. It's a business venture. And so that's an area where we see a tremendous need and, and the feeds play a role in that. They do play a role, a key role in the business aspect of it. But it's really looking at the whole business and figuring out how it can be done in a profitable way. Not only here in the States, but wherever your farm may be and do it also in a sustainable way. So finding that happy spot between environmental sustainability and economic viability. Thank you, John. I'm going to toss it to Dean Avisar, who has a question. And uh, with that, it looks like we've uh, exceeded our time. We will download all of the questions that have been provided and we'll gladly, whatever we didn't get to, we'll get responses and we'll email them back out to you. Uh, to the per We have your information since you um, registered. But I'm going to go ahead and toss it to Dean Avisar, who will ask a question and uh, lead us out. Uh, thank you very much, Diana. So, uh, indeed, a question to the to the three scientists. A lot of the questions that we have from the public has to do with the pollutions and the um, uh, and the economics. And I'm in fact curious uh, how much or how uh, how much uh, uh, pollution can be associated with the production of a megaton of proteins from the ocean versus a megaton of proteins from the land. Because at the end of the day, right, those, uh, this protein needs to be produced one way or the other, and uh, people are going to have to choose between the different sources. So uh, do you have an idea of how much uh, pollution we generate when we produce a megaton of proteins in the land versus in the ocean? And what's the, in other words, my question is, what's the efficiency of production? And what's the relative cost, if you can estimate that as well? Obviously, from the land, we have heard a lot that producing a ton uh, of proteins from beef or from uh, poultry or from pork generates also pollution through carbon dioxide, which is a very concerning uh, gas for greenhouse effect. So I'd like to hear from you uh, some, of the, some of the issues that we have in aquaculture related to pollution, broadly speaking, per production of megaton? That's a big question. <laughs> uh, the reality, we can model that. We, can, we know through energy budget or nitrogen budgets, we know exactly the biomass that we would have in the farm. We know how much we feed them in terms of a percentage of, of the biomass. What's the nutrient content? you know, nitrogen, phosphates, etc. We can actually pretty much, we know how much the fish are growing, how much they're excreting. We can calculate pretty accurately that. So we'll have an answer for that. But then you have to plug in, that's where you come in and the physical oceanographers come in and that's where the science comes behind because we're going to have them to develop a model of dispersion of all that biomass, all that nut uh, nutrients and suspended solids that we are producing and see what's going to be the dispersion, considering again, again, depth and current. That's what we've, why we've been talking about the offshore environment. We can continue, for example, recirculating aquaculture systems. They, you know, they recirculate, they take up, uh, uh, you know, the biofilters take care of, uh, and the solids can be taken care of. It's much smaller impact, but the production capability of those systems is also much smaller. So in my view, we have no option but going offshore. And that's again, a big challenge because it's going to take automation. It's going to take, uh, you know, it's not for the small, it's not for the hard painted, so to speak. I'm sure John and Aaron can, uh, you know. Yeah, Dean, it's a really good question. Um, I'll just go quickly and let John jump in. But um, there've been a number of life cycle analysis studies, formal LCA studies done um, comparing different kinds of aquaculture 
to different kinds of terrestrial animal production. So is it more efficient to produce salmon or chicken? Um, and in a lot of those studies, um, aquaculture comes out very favorably. Um, what has been less well researched, although some workers have made some efforts down this road, has been comparing wild fisheries to aquaculture. Um, we know there are a lot of costs in fishing that are uncounted, uh, fuel, carbon, uh, bait. Um, bait consumption by industrial fishing fleets is enormous and almost never accounted. Um, so it's hard to sort of give a really precise answer to that question because there's just a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, but it's a really interesting field and people are starting to ask those questions in a, in a, in a more rigorous way. Um, I'll jump off and let you. Yeah, that, that lines up with, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned the life cycle analysis. There was a report that came out uh, a few years ago, the Blue Frontiers report. Um, looking at comparing these different types of food production systems. And as Aaron mentioned, they do, you know, aquaculture is very favorable in terms of those metrics. But in terms of pollution, in aquaculture, it's very simple. You control the cycle, right? So whether you're in a land-based aquaculture production system or offshore, you know what that fish is eating. You know what it, it's excreting, okay? You're controlling the entire cycle. Whereas in wild fisheries and other forms of food production, you're sort of leaving it up to nature, right? So let's look at wild, wild fisheries in terms of take long lining, for instance. Okay, so you're putting out, how many of those hooks do you have to put out to get a fish on each one, right? So you have to put out miles and miles and miles of hooks to finally catch what you need. And what happens if you lose that line? Oh, well, there's, there's pollution in the ocean. So I think anybody uh, who, even right here off South Florida coast, diving and fishing off here, you go out to our reefs and all that and you see trash all around them, right? You see, you know, trap lines from lobster traps. You see stuff from people partying on the sandbar on the weekends. So at the end of the day, in terms of pollution production, aquaculture is not really the, <clears throat> the bad guy that they, they make it out to be, so. Well, thanks again, everybody, uh, in particular to the speakers, as well as to the organizers of this uh, uh, interesting um, uh, sequence of C-Secret. Thanks to everybody that participated, and see you on November 10. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.